share files. Once the World Wide Web was invented, well, you could sell things on the web, right? And eBay came into existence. Once there was a lot of content on the web, that enabled people to make money by being Google or Yahoo. Did anybody 30 years ago, or if some of you are younger than that, foresee Facebook? No. Okay, and this is part of a deep thing that, that, that is part of what I wrote in the conversation we had. Not only do we not know what will happen, we do not even know what can happen. And that in turn means that reason, which is the highest human virtue of our beloved enlightenment, is an insufficient guide for living your life. If you don't know what can happen, you can't reason about it. But that frees us up in wonderful ways because it, it calls us to our full humanity. How do we do it? I mean, go ask people in the business world. How do you make business decisions? I started four companies. You don't know what you're doing. You're out there trying to figure out what the world's going on, and you, you do stuff and hope that it works. Same thing in policy formation. So, so that means that we have reason and emotion and intuition and imagination, and strongly we have metaphor. And these are ways of bridging to what we can't talk about. Um, so all of that's in front of us, and I think it's the bridge between the two cultures of, uh, of the humanities and the sciences and a lot more. It's, a, it's, it's an arrow into us addressing what our humanity is, which I think is the deepest task. Now let me get a little closer to where you guys are and then shut up and we'll have a discussion. Um, so let me say a little bit about economics. And I've actually published in economics, but not in economics. If you don't know it, let me tell you, let me just take a few minutes to tell you the framework of current economic theory, in particularly in North America and England. So do you all know competitive general equilibrium? Some of you do. Do some not? You, okay. So here it is. Um, it was done by Arrow and DeBrew, and they got the Nobel Prize for it. Here's the problem. You all know supply and demand curves. Okay, so here's the supply button. Demand for butter and where they cross is where the price is struck and, and, and markets clear. So the outstanding problem for classical economics is how come there's a, a, a price where markets clear and for one good it's easy. But suppose that you've got bread and butter and you want to have bread with your butter um, and but when you vary the price of bread you vary the demand for butter, right? Well it's no longer so obvious that there is a vector of two prices such that markets clear simultaneously for bread and butter. Uh, a, a, a 19th century economist named Roy Ra invented an auctioneer who stands up and yells out prices until markets clear. What Aaron de Brew did is, is an utterly gorgeous theory. Here it is. Ready? You imagine that at the beginning of time there's an auctioneer and a whole bunch of players like us and here's a, it takes a while to get your mind around this, okay? There are what Aaron de Brew called dated contingent goods. So an example of a dated contingent good is a barrel of wheat, uh, or a bushel of wheat, delivered to my doorstep uh, on December the 1st, if and only if uh, Obama grows a, an afro. I picked that because I think it's <laughs> I don't know what it would do to the red states. I do know. <laughs> well, the election's over. <laughs> um, so that's a dated contingent good. So competitive general equilibrium imagines the following. It imagines that you can pre-state at the beginning of time all possible dated contingent goods. Okay? Just try to imagine that. Just imagine it. Then they prove using a fixed point theorem, that there is a vector of prices for all possible dated contingent goods under the following assumptions. Each agent, like all of us, has some probability distribution about all of the events that are going to happen in the future, 
including whether or not Saddam Hussein, I mean, not Saddam Hussein, whether or not Obama uh, will, will grow an afro. I, I will still assert here of, of, of Saddam Hussein shaving off his mustache, but he's dead, so he can't do it anymore. But I haven't told the story for a while. Um, so we all have a probability distribution of all the ways that the future is going to unroll. And based on our different probability distributions, we come up with, we bid, and we come up with a vector of prices. And they show, by a fixed point theorem, that there exists a vector of prices such that all markets fail. It's an absolutely gorgeous theory, and it's the foundation of economics, of contemporary North American and English economics. Okay, because it says, look, we've got this theory about markets theory. Neat. So there's two other main theories in economics. One of them says is that gee, under competitive general equilibrium, nobody should trade on the stock market. And then they notice that there's trading on the stock market and there's bubbles. And they say, and busts, and they say, well, competitive general equilibrium is no good. So they come up with a theory called rational expectations, which is roughly, if we all believe that the economy is going to do X, like the prices of tulips are going to go up, or the price of oil is going to go up, and we all bet on that, our assumption about how the economy will behave drives our behavior, which instantiates the economy that we think is going to happen, and it's called rational expectations. And you can get bubbles and busts out of it. So that's the second theory that's out there. And the third is game theory, which I, I guess you all, because everyone knows what game theory is. So the third main framework is game theory. Now let me tell you what's left out of the story. The most important thing. <laughs> and it's what's driving what's going on. How many goods and services were in the economy 50,000 years ago? What do we think? A couple thousand? A lot of rocks. <laughs> of various and sundry shapes. <coughs> How many goods and services are in the global economy now? Well, it's estimated that there's about a billion in New York. Okay, so maybe there's 10 billion goods and services in the global economy. Will we accept that? Because I, I really want to make a big point out of this. Yeah. What, why did we get from 1,000 to 10 billion? How did that happen? The economists have no theory about it at all. None. I know, I've been arguing with them for 20 years. They have zero theory. But I'm going to tell you that because I do. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you the theory, but it matters to us because it's part of what's going on that, that you guys are struggling with. Okay. And, and to jump ahead, there's an onslaught of new goods and services for the reason I want to try to show you in a minute. Um, that is going to crowd up against the finite planet. And the question is, is why is there this onslaught of new goods and services? Uh, sorry, but you asked an uh, economist and you asked yourself, would you talk to any psychologists? No. Okay, just check. Are you? No. Okay, so. Um, This is actually a mathematical theory and a theorem, and proven, and it's out there in the literature. And there's finally one economist on it, so maybe it will get heard. But it turns out that in American economics, if you're not an economist, you don't count. Which is fair enough. Here's the theory. <laughs> on the x-axis, I want you to imagine that you're looking at France. I picked France because it's it's in one of my books, it's called Adam and the Universe, and it's in the last chapter. And on this axis, I want to plot the diversity of stuff that grows out of the ground of France every year. So it could be just wheat. Or it could be wheat and some iron ore, and it could be wheat and some iron ore and some milk. Right? Okay. So I just want the diversity from one thing to ten things to a hundred things to a thousand things, so on. So this axis has the diversity of things coming out of the soil of France every year. On this axis, I want to plot the diversity of different production technologies I have, which are ways of doing things with things to make things. Okay? Does everybody sort of know the term production technology? Uh, so this is the diversity of production technologies. And I just want to give you an intuitive feeling for the mathematical theory. 
Uh, suppose 